everyone. Welcome to my project on IKEA Russia's public relations campaign, Quarantine Fort, Instruction Manuals. A little about the brand. IKEA is a furniture brand that tends to be more moderately priced. The company was founded in Sweden, but is now headquartered in the Netherlands. Its stores are set up as a showroom display, so customers can see the furniture in a home setting and try the products before purchasing. Its business structure follows a franchising format, which allows it to expand around the globe. The company also provides instructional building guides using only images, which eradicates the need for translations. This is beneficial due to IKEA's presence in many cultures. IKEA's vision is to create a better everyday life for the many people, and the business idea reflects this by offering a wide range of well-designed, functional, home furnishing products at prices so low that as many people as possible will be able to afford them. Ingvar Kamprad began the company with these values and once said, why are beautiful products only made for a few buyers? It must be possible to offer good design and function at low prices. According to their website, IKEA values sustainability, affordability, and quality. The company uses sustainable materials, 100% of their cotton comes from sustainable sources, and by the end of 2020, IKEA plans to shift completely to sustainable wood sources and will be energy independent. So a little about Russia. Russia's political system is classified as a federal semi-presidential constitutional republic. According to the Constitution, it is a democratic, federative, law-based state with a republican form of government. What this means is that the people vote for representatives to make their decisions, similar to the U.S. The country has an executive branch with a president and prime minister, though the president holds most of the power, a legislative branch made of 616 parliament members, and a judicial branch which has 19 justices. According to Freedom House, Russia has a freedom score of 20, which puts it in the category of being not free. The main reason for the score is that the political rights in Russia are very low. There is an uneven distribution of power because although there are three branches of government, the president holds the most power. He or she can appoint the prime minister, justices, and may issue decrees if proposed legislation fails to pass. As for the economy, it is considered moderately free by the index of economic freedom. The main problems with the economy are that they have a flat tax rate as opposed to a progressive tax rate, which puts a burden on the low-income families, and corruption in the government, which leads to an oligarchy of power and wealth. The currency of Russia is called the ruble. Russia's economy is largely made up of agriculture, forestry, and fishing due to the large land mass. However, there is strong economic inequality, which means the richest people hold the majority of the money, and those who are less fortunate struggle to support themselves. According to the Moscow Times, an estimated 13% of the country is in poverty, while the top 3% richest people in Russia hold 90% of the country's wealth, mostly in the capital of Moscow. Russia's GDP in 2018 was 1.658 trillion. The country has an unemployment rate of 6.1%, and the average income is 49,306 rubles per month, which is roughly 700 US dollars. According to Freedom House, Russia has an internet freedom score of 31 out of 100, which is not considered free. The basis for this is that there are limits to content and obstacles to access, such as the sovereign internet law, which gives the government the ability to shut off connections within Russia and filter content in an emergency. According to Statista, 81% of the population aged 15 to 75 have access to the internet, although as aforementioned, it is censored. The most utilized social media channel is YouTube, followed by Contacti, which is a social media site similar to Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. Russia's literacy rate as of 2018 is 99.73%. As for media penetration, a 2016 study by Deloitte showed that 92% of people regularly use the television, 58% regularly listen to the radio, 54% play video games, 52% use printed media, 41% read printed books, 39% read electronic books, 33% go to the cinema, and 13% go to the theater. However, a disclaimer states that this data may have somewhat of a margin for error because it was collected via an online survey. These are the estimated cultural dimensions of Russia and the Netherlands compared according to HofstadInsights.com. 
Russia has a high power distance with a score of 93, while the Netherlands is slightly lower at 38. People in cultures with a high power distance tend to accept the fact that power is distributed unequally, and in Russia this is true both financially and politically. Russia has a moderately low individualism score, meaning the culture has less value for the self. Relationships are very important in society, and kindling a personal and authentic relationship with customers is valuable. Conversely, the Netherlands has a high individualism score, so people in this culture are more self-reliant and business relationships are less important. Both Russia and the Netherlands have fairly low masculinity, meaning the culture values doing things that they enjoy over doing things that are seen as successful. People in these societies tend to be more modest about achievements, except for those in higher power. Russia has a very high uncertainty avoidance, while the Netherlands is average. High uncertainty avoidance means that the people are less trusting of unknown situations and ambiguity. They prefer to have context, background knowledge, and rules. Both Russia and the Netherlands have a high long-term orientation score, meaning their cultures tend to adapt well to new situations, are more pragmatic about the future, and have a tendency to save and invest. Finally, Russia has a low score on indulgence. This means that people in this society are more restrained and view leisure and luxury as unimportant. They may feel that gratifying desires is wrong. The challenge is that because most of Europe went on lockdown to prevent the spread of coronavirus, global trade has greatly decreased according to allied market research. Supply also went down because the majority of factories were unable to work at full capacity during the pandemic. However, it is important to remain on brand while keeping in mind that the quarantine is very serious and is not something to be treated with apathy. It will be easy for a company to miss the target message if it does not tread lightly, and IKEA needs to avoid the appearance of capitalizing on the pandemic. The problem this campaign aims to address is staying entertained and keeping children occupied during the quarantine. IKEA hopes to encourage social distancing while also providing people with a fun activity that highlights one of its major strengths, which are the brand's easy-to-follow instructional guides. The opportunity came in January of this year when Russia began testing for coronavirus and began the process of closing foreign borders to prevent the spread of the virus. By March, all air passenger transport was suspended, except in cases of bringing Russian citizens home. Also in March, the government issued an order to close all schools, cultural institutions, bars, and restaurants. The lockdown provided the opportunity to appeal to a restrained, high uncertainty avoidance society. While cultures with high uncertainty avoidance tend to prefer in-person shopping to online shopping, according to a 2006 University of Cape Town study, the quarantine is requiring many people to shift to online shopping for many of their needs. This creates the need to position IKEA as a trustworthy, helpful brand so that if people in Russia are looking to shop for furniture during this time, IKEA will be a viable option. This SWOT analysis breaks up the factors that led up to the campaign. The strongest internal factors for the company are IKEA's mission and business idea, which align well with Russia's low indulgence. IKEA seeks to make quality furniture at an affordable price, which people in a restrained society are likely to see as a good investment. The internal weaknesses are that IKEA cannot open the showroom during the pandemic, which is one of the key features of an IKEA shopping experience. Also, factories are currently working at less than full capacity, so stock is low. The external opportunities are that stores are closed, so people are turning to online shopping, which is usually less common in high uncertainty avoidance societies. This gives IKEA the chance to prove itself as a trustworthy source for online shopping. Also, although people are stuck in the house, this can be spun as a positive thing because of Russia's low individualism and the importance of family in their society. Some external threats are that the internet is heavily restricted by the government and there are economic troubles, both because of the pandemic and because of large income gaps. So the theme of this campaign is that people and families can still have fun while staying home and staying safe. The tagline hashtag is in Russian, but it roughly translates to I'm at home IKEA. The goal of this campaign is to promote social distancing and to help families to make quarantining fun. Some of the key messages are that families can stay entertained by building pillow forts together and to promote social distancing. The supporting messages are that IKEA's instruction manuals are easy to follow and the furniture from IKEA can be used in many fun ways. 
The impact objectives are to increase awareness that IKEA's instruction manuals are easy to use and to encourage followers to share their fort photos, thus generating crucial word of mouth marketing. The output objectives are to gain recognition as a trustworthy, people-friendly furniture brand and to remain relevant even when people are unable to come to the IKEA showroom. The strategies for this campaign are to use social media to build relationships with followers and potential customers and to provide help for people who are looking for activities to do during the quarantine. The tactics are first to develop the structures and the building guides, then to write the posts for Instagram and create Instagram stories with engaging content. The next step is to share any photos that were under the campaign's hashtag and to perform social listening on any posts and answer questions. The primary audience for this campaign is families with children. According to a study by financing company Ernest, IKEA's key demographics are low to middle class people aged 20 to 34. I would also expect that the target audience is people who have one or two children because of the photos IKEA shared, none had more than two children in the picture. The secondary audience is anyone who is stuck at home. While most people who participate have children, there were some posts under the hashtag that did not have children. The demographics are still low to middle class 20 to 34 year olds. Of those who do not have children, many of the photos were of people's pets in the forts. So based on the target audience, a good media channel to use is Instagram. This is the most recent Instagram demographic data for Russia. 58% of the Russian Instagram users are women and they are mostly aged 25 to 44, which aligns well with the target audience of parents of young children. There are over 47 million Instagram users in Russia, which accounts for about 33% of the total Russian population. The main media channel for this campaign was IKEA Russia's Instagram. The page utilized both permanent posts and stories. The message on this channel is that families who follow safe social distancing protocol can still have fun together. The page promoted staying home and getting creative with the forts and focused on appealing to parents who may be running out of ideas to entertain their kids. Many news sources have picked up the story as well, and the overall message is the same in every article. IKEA is trying to help people get through the quarantine. You can use IKEA products or anything else you may already have, and if you're running out of things to do, building forts is something you can try. So these are the instructional manuals that IKEA Russia released. They are formatted similarly to IKEA's product building guides, but instead offer suggestions on how to build at-home forts. The furniture and the guides are actual IKEA products, but the disclaimer mentions that people at home may use similar items they own. The disclaimer also warns to ensure the structure is safe and secure and not to leave children unattended. IKEA Russia launched their pillow fort guides on Instagram in a carousel. The caption says, Building Domic. You think, what else to do with the children? Build a fort with them. Yes, yes, such as in your childhood which you built from stools, blankets, and everything that came to hand. We have prepared instructions for creating forts, from the classic Vig Vam to the unexpected Nora. Build houses according to our projects, create your own, and upload photos using the hashtag I'm at home IKEA. Essentially, the caption is saying, if you're looking for something to do, here are some forts you can build. Remember your childhood, get creative, and share your photos with us. This aligns with the key messages because the caption gets the point across that they are aimed to help families, give people something to do, and encourages staying home with the hashtag. The IKEA Russia Instagram account has pinned this story to their profile, which is updated when people share their images after following the instructional guides. These are some of the posts made on the story. I was unable to get a direct translation since the text is embedded, but this first post says something roughly along the lines of, have you already built Vigvam, Nora, or Crepost? Hashtag I'm at home IKEA. Get inspired by the ideas of our followers. The other posts in this story are reposts of people participating in the challenge to build one of IKEA's forts. These are some of the posts on news media, and although they are not posted on Russian news sources, it shows how the campaign expanded to other cultures. These articles reinforce the idea that IKEA is doing its part to help families find things to do while stuck in the house. One of the major structural factors that went into building this campaign is the low internet freedom in Russia. While the government does not explicitly state what content is being filtered, the company needed to choose a channel that was able to reach the right target audience and that would not be filtered out. Of Hofstede's cultural dimensions, the ones that impacted this campaign the most were power distance, individualism, and indulgence. 
Russia has a high power distance, which means that status is important in the society. This is apparent in the campaign, as the highlighted posts that were shared on the IKEA Russia Instagram page were pages with follower counts higher than 700,000. The page shared only a few low follower posts at the very end of the story. Individualism also has a place in the campaign. Because individualism is fairly low in Russia, relationships and doing things as a group are important to the culture. Thus, this campaign is not aimed to entertain the parents, although they are the ones most likely to see the posts, but to bring the family together. Indulgence can be found in this campaign as well, because the products are not being displayed as a luxury or indulgence, but as something that has many uses, and furniture is something that any family can utilize. IKEA's tendency to be more affordable also plays well into Russia's restrained culture. In the circuit of culture, regulation affects this campaign largely because of the way the government controls the media. This caused the choice of social media channel and explains why no other news media in Russia picked up the story. The cultural norms that play into the campaign include the practicality of the products and the appeal to people's sense of family. Representation is apparent in the way IKEA Russia frames the products. They aren't just chairs or blankets, they represent time to spend with your family and being together at home. Identity factors into the campaign because IKEA is attempting to create the organizational identity of being a reasonable, helpful, family-oriented, and trustworthy choice for furniture shopping. The production of this campaign entailed creating the fort building guides and sharing on the channels. To account for consumption, the IKEA Russia Instagram account relied heavily on social listening. The people running the account followed the hashtag to see what people were saying, and the comments on the page were largely positive. The brand also utilized the positive response by sharing people's photos of their at-home forts. The timeline of this campaign was implemented fairly quickly. Russia began closing borders in January, but was not fully on lockdown until March. In April, IKEA launched a separate press release of the recipe to their famous meatballs, with the similar intention of giving quarantined people something to do at home. On May 8th, the quarantine fort blueprints were released on the IKEA Russia Instagram, and the Instagram story Domic was created to share the followers' participation on their page. From May 8th until May 20th, the account updated the Instagram story with photos from followers, but although the account isn't sharing anymore, many people are still sharing their photos as recently as July. The campaign was well covered by the news media even here in the U.S., and the campaign continues to be shared on news outlets, Pinterest, and other blogs. The impact objectives were to increase awareness of how easy IKEA guides are to follow and to encourage people to share their own photos, which would help with word of mouth. I would determine that these objectives were met because the hashtag was used on over 120 posts and many times those participating had a large following, which provided IKEA with positive brand advocation. Also, many outside news sources such as blogs, Pinterest pages, and news websites picked up the story, which provided the campaign with a whole outside audience from Instagram. The output objectives are to gain recognition as a people-friendly furniture brand and to remain relevant during a time when showroom shopping is not realistic. Again, I feel that these objectives were met because many people participated in sharing their forts using the hashtag and tagging IKEA. The page also interacted well with its following. For example, on the original post, someone had commented asking about the price of one of the items in the guides, and IKEA responded with follow-up questions and provided the person with an interactive response. Overall, I would say that the campaign was successful in reaching a large audience within IKEA's target demographic. One thing that could have improved is that IKEA could have used more channels than just Instagram, because a larger number of people in Russia use VK, but there are no posts on the IKEA VK page. The campaign used a lot of structural and cultural factors to build the campaign message, and it came through in the way they shared those messages. Some takeaways from this campaign are to use some of the cultural differences to your advantage. For example, Russia had a very low individualism score compared to the Netherlands, but instead of pushing individualism on the Russian culture, IKEA utilized that to make a campaign aimed at family.